Hi there, this is Chris, and this is a video on assignment three, and I apologize for being late, and I apologize that I didn't get to it in class today. Uh, so assignment three is, as the title says, everything about multiprocessing. So you're going to have to do lots of multiprocessing here. Specifically, you're going to use Fork and Exec CVP, and you're going to use uh, weight PID and you're going to use pipe and you're going to use dupe or probably dupe 2 as it turns out and all the different things that we've learned about uh, in order to do four uh, different programs. Um, the first two are relatively minor um, and the third one and fourth one are a little bit bigger. Um, so let's uh, let's dig right in. So the first assignment is uh, pipeline. Or the first part of the assignment is pipeline. Now pipeline does the following. Pipeline takes in two parameters that are basically command line arguments that include the program name as the first argument and then all of its arguments after that and then a second argument list that's the same thing. And basically, and then it takes in an array of PIDs, which is empty when you start, this will be uh, filled when the pipeline function returns. And we'll have two PIDs in it that are the two, uh, the two PIDs for the two children that your pipeline is going to create, uh, the first of which will send its standard output into the second one's standard input. Okay, so what does that actually mean? Well. Uh, what you're basically doing is you're setting up a system like the following. Okay, let me pull up a, a terminal here and show you what's going on here. Uh, so you're basically setting up a, a two programs that will basically do the following. Okay, if you do something like the following, uh, let's see, let's just say I have a test file.txt. And inside it, I'll put some fruit names, B A N A N A, and apple, and uh, donut, which is not a fruit at all. <laughs> and let's put in a cantaloupe. And so you have uh, these sorts of uh, fruits and other things in your list. Okay. And that is test file. Now let's say we wanted to cat test file, in other words, print it out, right? And we wanted to then uh, pipe it through sort, which would sort the words in the list. So what's happening here? Well, cat is taking the file and inputting from the file and outputting through standard out. Because if you just type cat test file, then it prints out to the terminal, which is standard out. Okay, and this is important. And then sort is taking input from standard in. How do I know it's standard in? If I just type sort and start typing things, right? And if I type, uh, and then these are standard in, and it's just accepting this. And then when I do control D, it will actually end the input and it will sort it. Sort will actually sort it. So sort is taking standard input and printing it to standard output. And cat is taking input from this file, as it turns out, and printing it to standard output. All right, so what does that actually mean in terms of your pipeline file? Well, when you do cat test file.txt pipe through sort, the standard out of text of cat, standard out of cat becomes the standard in of sort. And how do we do that? Well, we have to do that via a pipe. Okay? So you have to say basically you have to pipe the output of test file or cat test file txt into sort. Okay. In fact, later in the next assignment, you'll do uh, you'll be able to do it through uh, more different more pipes as well. Basically, standard out of cat becomes standard in of sort. Standard out of sort becomes standard in for word count. Okay. Now, pipeline is only two of these, but that's how it works. Okay. Now. Uh, Let's talk a little bit more about the actual pipeline itself. Well, remember what pipe does, okay? Pipe, when you say FDS, when you have uh, an array of, PI, or of uh, file descriptors, basically like this, int 
fds2, you have a two, and then you do that. Pipe creates a, a two file descriptors. fds0 is the reader, and fds1 is the writer. Okay. When you write from into fds1, you can read that text from fds0. Okay. Now let's talk just briefly about uh, the example we had before. We had cat file test.txt or whatever it was. Okay. Well, that is going to need to redirect its standard out. Okay. And then we also have the uh, sort. Right. Well. And sort needs its standard in redirected. Okay, so basically standard, and I should do it this way, I guess. We should say that uh, standard out, so basically FDS1, which is the writer, okay, okay, needs to be kind of translated to SD standard out for file test, and FDS zero needs to be translated to SD uh, standard in for sort. Okay, that's really all there is to it. This is not a long program. There will be two forks in this file, one to fork the first program and one to fork the second program, and not the third program in this case, but one to fork, let's say, uh, one to fork cat, and then one to fork sort in this case. Okay, so that's how pipeline works. All right, the next Part of the assignment is subprocess. Now, subprocess is uh, this one in C++, by the way. So uh, make sure you get your C++ uh, going. Um, it, it feels a lot like C still, but um, it uh, is technically C++. Now, this uses a struct called subprocess underscore t, and this pro this subprocess basically function does the following. Okay, it the subprocess function. Uh, creates one executable, okay, and it, and in fact, here's the uh, the definition for it. it. Creates one executable, which is the same as the pipeline one, by the way. It has a list, a uh, command list in an array, and it has uh, two booleans, which say, do I want to provide the supply child input, or do I want to ingest the child output? Okay, so in other words, if it's true. I want to uh, get returned to me in the subprocess t struct a file descriptor which I am allowed to write to, which will be uh, input into the subprocess into the child. Okay. If I have true for the second or the third parameter, actually the ingest child output. Okay. Basically. This one says I'm going to get a file descriptor such that if I read from it, it is whatever the child produced on standard out. Okay, it's whatever the child produced uh, on standard out, and that's the uh, that's how it works. Okay, so it's kind of similar to the uh, it's similar to the pipeline in the sense that you've got a pipe here, uh, or at least one pipe. I've probably said too much already. Um, that you need to uh, handle such that you will be able to get back uh, the pipe by the file descriptor such that you can either write to that subprocess or you can read from it. Okay, so that's basically the big idea. Um, I'm not sure there's much else to tell you about that one. So the next one is uh, a little more difficult to kind of understand. This is the trace function. Now basically, in some sense, you are writing a little bit of a debugger. Okay, you're writing a debugger that uh, captures all system calls and reports reports the output of those system call, or actually the not necessarily the output the reports the details of those system calls to you okay so if we had a function like this main function okay and we uh, used the trace function to do it well what it does is it says okay first we got a syscall 59 and uh, it returned zero, and then we have a syscall 12, and it returned 14434304. And by the way, some of these numbers will be different for you than in the assignment handout here. Okay, uh, don't worry about some of the numbers. Some, some of them might be the same, but some of them are going to be uh, different, and, and Sanity Check will uh, ignore values that are different. It'll just look for a value and then ignore it if it's different. 
okay? Uh, and then there's lots of other things that happen, and then uh, we get a bunch more syscalls here, and then finally we get uh, a syscall 231 here that does not return anything, and then the program exits. And that should be the output of your uh, trace. Okay, so again, trace captures all the system calls from a program that uh, it runs, and it reports those to you. Okay, so it's an interesting way to see all the different uh, system calls that your program is making. And in fact, there's more than you might think, right? There's lots of different system calls for uh, things here. Some are, by the way, for our opening and writing and closing and reading and closing and so forth, some of those. There's also a lot of other ones uh, happening as well. Okay, um, that is the uh, uh, simple trace, by the way. Then we have a full trace where it gives you much more information about that, okay, about the actual uh, system calls. Okay, it doesn't just say uh, what the system calls are. It's a syscall. It actually says, like, specifically which system call it is. And you have to look this up in a map. And in fact, I think there's two maps here that you have to uh, utilize to look the information up. You know, okay, there's also an error map as well that you have to look up. So there's a few different maps here that you have to uh, wrap your head around to get that. Okay. Uh, trace is definitely more challenging um, because it has a lot more going on um, and so make sure you read through a lot of this here. The big thing to understand is, a little bit anyway, is how ptrace works. Um, ptrace is another system call and it allows a program to uh, make another program stop at various points, particularly after system calls and so forth, and it allows it to um, capture that information. Okay, so we give you a kind of a, a basic one that doesn't do much um, in the starter code. Make sure you read through all the header files and make sure you understand the actual um, maps and things that we'll, uh, we'll talk about in a few minutes. Okay, the, uh, the initial starter code, okay, basically um, ignores a lot of things and then or ignores kind of the the simple and rebuild and then um, it ends up uh, using this process command line flags to uh, to actually run the trace itself or to actually well, process it and then it runs the trace based on on those okay uh, we in this case we fork off a, a child which is the name of the program that you've um, that you've actually asked it to trace through, okay? And then it calls uh, ptrace on ptrace trace me, which basically says, hey, I'm about to trace you, okay? And then it raises a signal stop on itself. So remember, this is in the child, and it starts the ch ch child running and then stops it. Why? Because we're in the process of tracing it. So it's kind of like a debugger uh, where it runs maybe one line and stops. In this case, it runs a couple lines of the actual, or, or it it uh, stops it before it actually runs the program that we're trying to do. Okay, why? Because we still need to set some things up in the parent. Okay, so you can read through this um, about how it how it actually uh, does its thing here. Okay, um, and then the uh, tracer itself, okay, has to. Uh, basically run a wait PID and another P trace here to say what happens when the child actually uh, stops. So in this case, when we do wait PID in this case, well, it stop, it ends up returning the PID of the child process that just stopped. And so we know uh, what the PID is and so forth. Okay. And then it says, well, yes, it actually stopped. And then it sets some more uh, tracing ability on the uh, actual child process. Okay. All right. And then what do we have? We have the, uh, this is basically a while true loop that goes through and um, for the basic one anyway, just keeps the program running, okay, until it gets to a system call. All right. And then that's what this does. It says ptrace, ptrace until a system call, and then wait until the uh, the function gets to it or the program gets to a system call and that's that okay and you can read down through all the details of this as well um, a couple interesting things are that um, 
you need to find the op code, which is in percent RAX, which is one of the registers, um, as you know from 107. Uh, 107E, folks, RAX is one of the registers. It's kind of like R0. Um, and then you end up getting the details of that register, which, by the way, lives in the child process with another command called ptrace, uh, with ptrace peak user. This is reading the information from the, uh, from the actual uh, program itself. Okay, that's where it stores that opcode. Okay, and then you have to do a couple other things where you flush and so forth. Okay, and then now you need to do another uh, loop where you actually go ahead and uh, print out the uh, return value, which you have to do by another ptrace uh, function. Okay, all of this is uh, written for you. Okay, and uh, what you're going to do is you are going to uh, modify it to actually get more details. Okay, so you need to um, change trace.cc to support simple mode and print out these oops, these details uh, like this. Again, this one's not getting the names or using those maps at all. It's just saying, look, a system call happened. The number was one. Here was the return value. Okay, and that's uh, that's what it was. And then uh, program exit. In fact, there should be a new line right in there. I have to fix the um, fix the output here. Okay. All right, there's some words of wisdom and uh, for the simple trace. And again, don't worry about the details of the numbers. Um, they will, they're important, but they're not specific. Like they, they will be different on different times through the program. Okay, then you have to go for full mode. And uh, full mode is basically the same idea. Okay, again, I have a uh, missing new line here. I'll have to fix that. Um, it has a, uh, it's basically the same idea, except now you have to get the actual details of the, uh, what function call it is. And this is where you're going to um, read through the maps that get the error number and get the actual names of all the function calls. We've actually pulled those from some header files, um, but we've given those, uh, those details uh, to you. Okay, all right. Um, Let's see. How do you actually get the uh, argument? The argument list. Uh, another map. So these are all the little maps you have to read through. Um, I'll let you read the details of all of those uh, there. Okay. Um, this is pretty specific. Again, I don't want to necessarily go through all the details because it's all written out for you here. Um, but it's a matter of knowing the maps and knowing how to read through them and actually uh, get those details. Okay, all right, some more output here. And uh, again, we've talked a little bit about ptrace um, as you go uh, through here. The maps, here's where it talks about the different maps here um, that you have to use for getting the system call names and the error messages and, and so forth. Okay, again, lots of details here that you have to uh, read through. Okay, so basically, um, what's the takeaway on this? This is one of the harder parts of this assignment. I think it's uh, it's challenging mainly because there's a lot going on and there's a lot uh, of things like reading memory from another program through registers that seems um, tricky and it's it's uh, it's not easy, but it's not uh, too, too bad uh, when you actually go and, uh, and dig into the details. Um, again, feel free to ask questions on Piazza, come to office hours. We'll help you uh, out if you have trouble understanding what you're trying to do. Okay, so the final part of assignment three is uh, kind of a cool program called Farm, which is <clears throat> basically going to use all the cores on a particular myth machine to factor numbers for you. Okay, and there's going to be all sorts of processes that you're going to launch onto the various uh, processors of the myth machines and they are going to wait for your program to feed them numbers and they are going to uh, factor those numbers. Okay, so here's how it actually works. Um, take a look at this uh, Python program. Now the actual uh, factoring is going to be done by, by a Python program. Uh, you don't really need to understand Python necessarily, it's, although it's a fairly easy program here to, to understand. Uh, but basically, 
uh, Python get this Python program uh, checks the command line arguments and see if it's self-halting or not. And then it and it is self-halting as it turns out when we when we run it. And it is going to get its own PID and then it's going to go through this while loop. And in the while loop, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to stop itself. In other words, it's going to pause itself to wait for input from your program. Okay, so it's going to be a farm of all these different processes that are waiting for input from you as the coordinating process from your parent, as it turns out. Okay, once you your pro program continues this Python program, it is going to read in uh, a number, okay, and it's going to um, read the number and then start a timer immediately because we want to time how long it takes to factor these. Then it's going to actually factor it. Then it is going to uh, stop the timer and then it is going to print out the factorization, okay, and then it's going to continue back in the while loop and wait for another number. Eventually, you will close the input that you are sending to the uh, to this Python program. At which point, it will uh, close the actual Python program. Okay, so that's how the Python program does it. It's the one doing the factoring. Okay, so what do you have to do for this? Well, this is how it works. You say something like print app one three five seven new line one three five seven eight new line and then dot slash factor dot pi, and it will take a, those numbers one line after the other and factor each one of them. That's how the factor program actually works, okay? And you can time it and you can do uh, multiple ones there, okay? Now, if you have it as self-halting, well, you can start it out and then it just immediately stops, okay? And then you can send the kill system call, which basically, remember, doesn't necessarily kill it, it actually, in this case, continues it, okay? And then um, the number you want to actually factor gets printed out here, and it tells you how long it takes and so forth. Okay, so that's how the uh, the actual pro, uh, Python program works. Okay, um, this factorization is not a fast factorization. Um, you will see that when you this is actually good for testing because you can test and see how long it takes to do these things. Um, it's not uh, not fast, which is good. Okay, your job is to write a program that uh, runs on the myths and spawns several what we call workers, one for each core, and then of the self halting factor, and then sends numbers to that program to be factored. Okay, so here's how it might work. You might say time print f and then this long string separated by new line number separated by new lines and then send it into farm. It's as if you typed those numbers on the standard in, by the way. And then it should say how many CPUs there are, it should number them all, it should send all the workers on different CPUs, and then it should start factoring them, okay? And it will uh, factor all of those numbers, one on each core, uh, as it turns out, and it will take about the same amount of time for each one, but the total time is only gonna be the basically the time to do one because they're all happening. In parallel. Okay, so that's um, that's the the basic idea. Uh, of course, there is a struct here that you have to understand called worker. Okay, and uh, there's a uh, let's see, worker has a uh, it is a C plus plus struct by the way, so it has things like constructors in it. So it's got a constructor that takes in an argument, and uh, the Arguments for the constructor uh, are the uh, rather the parameters that end up getting uh, processed for the constructor. It basically sets SP to be uh, this. Guess what? That's a subprocess, which is from your other program, and then it um, immediately sets it to be not available, and it only becomes available um, when uh, you actually allow it to become available. You'll see that later. Okay, and then it has the two. Uh, variables that it uh, has inside the struct. Okay, all right, and then uh, there's a couple other constants in here, and then in main, uh, what we do is we have a signal, okay, which is sig child and mark workers is available. And remember, sig child gets, uh, sig child actually gets called 
or rather the signal handler for SIGCHAL gets called when the, your process continues or stops or halts. Okay, all right. And then you're going to spawn all the workers. You're gonna actually launch them all. And then you're going to send all the workers, uh, or all the numbers to those workers. And then you're going to wait for them all to be done. And then you're going to close them all. Okay, that's the basic idea of uh, this program. Okay, so you can read all the details about this um, as far as what, what is responsible, what you're responsible for there. Okay, um, and but basically we have we've implemented a little bit of some of these things, uh, most of this in here to actually broadcast the numbers to the workers. Um, you have to write a couple more lines of code down here, and um, Basically, this just kind of sets it up so that you can send the numbers to the uh, to the workers, okay? And you also should make sure that you uh, send you have a close all workers routine that sends uh, that stops all those programs. And remember, how do you stop those Python programs? You close the file that they are reading in from. Okay, so as if you can put Control D on the command line, or if the if it was reading from a file and the file ended. Okay. All right, so that's basically it. We give you some details about uh, farm here, um, but for the most part, uh, you've got the main function. You have to implement uh, these functions here. Okay, mark workers available. You have to implement spawn all workers, broadcast numbers to workers, wait, uh, wait for all workers, and close all workers. Okay, the basic idea is send all of these numbers to a bunch of Python processes that are waiting for you to send them numbers. All right, that should do it. Thanks, and again, put your questions on Piazza or stop by office hours. Thanks.